You are a thousand percent right. And one of the strongest points I tried to make in Conquer the Crash, which I've reiterated 20 times in essays since then, is this not a, a crisis of money printing. It's a crisis of debt. And there's so much of it, so much piled upon debt, piled upon debt. People were using debt as collateral to borrow money. I mean, it's amazing. So, so it's an inverted pyramid, and the weight of the top end where people literally are in trouble and can't pay is going to uh, help topple the whole thing over. So as we just said a minute ago, even though the Fed has created a trillion dollars of new money, even that is, is more or less lent because they're taking securities on from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that are guaranteed by the government. It's still backed by tax money. It's still debt-based money. We have a debt problem. Another aspect of Conquer the Crash, your examination of these two major depressions. And we all know about 1929, people have been drawing parallels now, it seems like, for months with the Great Crash. But you take it a step further, back to 1835, a deflationary episode. You conclude that this time around, that we may eclipse both of those in scope. Well, my case is that the wave of optimism that peaked out in 2000 was the same degree as the wave of optimism that finally peaked in 1720 in England with the South Sea bubble. And we said that before all of this happened. We, we said it way back before the bull market started, that this was the kind of bull market we were going to get, a speculative mania. And even though we can draw, and we have drawn, many terrific parallels with 1929-32 and 1835 to 1842, which were severe drops and deflationary periods, I think, and I don't often discuss it because people think it's sort of ridiculous or too radical. If you look back at 1720, people were so turned off with equity investments that the equity market in England did not make its final low until 64 years later in 1784 and didn't regain the same heights of 1720 for a 100 years. And I think that is the kind of society-wide that we will have. It's going to last several generations. I remember Sir Isaac Newton's comment, I can calculate the motions of the heavenly bodies but cannot fathom the madness of crowds. And I think that ties in with your point that not until this exuberance is lost by the hoi ploi, the unwashed masses, will we have a clearing of the system, as Mises would point out. As mentioned earlier, the Fed is doing everything that they can do to encourage banks back to their former lax lending practices. But this is just not working. Although the money supply is exploding, well, there's this other side of the equation that is translating into tight liquidity. Well, what's happening in the banks, I think behind closed doors, is that they're admitting to themselves that the collateral that's sitting in the vault, which are a pile of mortgages, are worth far less than what's written on the surface. If they went out in the marketplace and tried to sell them, they'd get 50 cents on the dollar. And that's why all the markets revalued themselves by half. Commodities dropped in half, stocks dropped in half, property dropped in half. I think it's because all of the debt has been essentially behind the scenes revalued in toto. But no one is quite sure who's going to step in and save what instruments. So they're, they're revaluing the, the financial markets to reflect the drop in the value of the total of outstanding debt. And now they're playing hot potato and musical chairs trying to figure out who's going to be stuck with the stuff that defaults and who, who's going to be saved by the taxpayer. So it's, it's a complex situation, but the banks definitely know that if they continue to lend, they've got a problem. They have to have people who can actually pay back or their situation is only going to get worse. So they have clamped down on the requirements. Now, that's only part of the picture. I'm sure, as you also know, we had this huge private market to take on mortgages and asset-backed debt of all kinds, which simply melted away. They can't repackage debt anymore and sell it out to the pension fund managers and the insurance companies like they used to do. They don't want it. So that was a huge source of new credit so that source of credit is gone and the source of bank credit is shrinking. You're only left with one institution, and that's the federal government. And the federal government's running massive deficits, and you can already hear the mumblings and rumblings among Congress people saying, look, we don't know how much more of this stuff we want to guarantee. This is getting scary. And this is where the psychology comes in. Deflation is going to win eventually can't help but point out that that's one of the first times that anyone's made that connection to the unbelievable amount of debt that was being floated out there in the form of SIVs, mortgage-backed securities, CDOs, all the leverage out there. And that has evaporated. But, you know, staying with this inflation-deflation theme, in Conquer the Crash, you note that once the credit crisis passes, that there will be little credit left. And inflation or hyperinflation could then come to pass. You didn't have much company on 
on this view, but it appears as though you were spot on. The dollar rebounded sharply last year, but has subsequently entered what appears to be a death spiral. And, you know, many top investment bankers are calling for fresh lows on the greenback as soon as the end of this year. Do you think that that part of your original scenario could play out here? I think it's going to play out, but not at this juncture, because this is the first and in a sense the last rally during which people are going to have an extremely high level of optimism even though we're in the bear market. If you notice, and and as you just pointed out, the dollar did jump very sharply when we had the first wave of deflation in 2008. Now that we're having this recovery period, and this is something we expected as well because the the dollar is the whole point. It's the new credit that's that's allowing markets to rally. And when we got down to only 2% bulls among traders in March, we said this, this market, we've counted five waves down under our Elliott wave model. We've got extreme bearishness like we have never seen in the figures for the S&P. This market's going to have a very sharp and scary rally is what we said for anybody who's a bear. So you want to get out of all your shorts and get out of the way. We're about to have a 40 to 60 percent retracement. We've had a 40 percent retracement in the Dow. There could be more to it, but this is only a bear market rally. Currently, not only do we have well over 90 percent bulls in the stock indexes, Everybody forgot about the fact that we were in the worst recession since the Great Depression. Now it's 90% bullish, but in the dollar, we're down to 3% bulls, 97% bears. I'm not a bit surprised that major institutions are calling for new lows. To me, the big surprise is going to be we're about to roll over again in all these investment markets, and the dollar is going to go up because credit will be disappearing and remaining dollars will be gaining in value. So we're not only going to repeat 2008, but I think we're going to repeat a bigger version of it in 2010, probably carrying into 2014. It should last quite a while. Now, once that happens, and a lot of this very bad debt simply goes by the wayside, and I think that's going to include state debt, municipal debt, corporate debt, pretty much across the board. Perhaps at that point, we could be in danger of a printing press type of situation, such as you would find in South America or Germany in 1922-23. We're not doing that now. They're still relying on credit. And every bailout is an IOU, and you, you owe us, and we have equity and all that sort of thing. So they haven't resorted to the printing press. The government is always late on everything it does. They passed all the securities laws in 1934, two years after the bottom. You know, So... They're not going to figure this out until we've we've run the course in the deflation, and then they'll if they do decide to fight it with money, it'll be paper money out of the printing press, and that's when we have to worry about hyperinflation. But until then, there's so much debt out there that can collapse faster than they can even print. And of course, they're not really printing; they're sort of exchanging money for debt at the moment. We've got a big valley to cross before that hyperinflation becomes, you know, stares us in the face as a possibility. And even then, I think I said in the book. That's the time when it might happen. I mean, there's a 1 in 20 chance that they'll sober up and do the right thing and go back to real money. Speaking of uh, hyperinflation and what happened in 2008, with these government bailouts, it turns out now, and I'm sure you're aware of this, that Ginny May, Fannie and Freddie, add in the Federal Housing Authority, the government owns 66%, two-thirds of the mortgage market. When did we turn into a socialist country, and what's the end game here for the domestic economy? We've been turning into a socialist country for over 100 years. I would say, you know, the big change came with Wilson. He helped create the income tax and the Federal Reserve. Uh, Both came out under his his administration, which were two of the biggest disasters we've ever had. Under the cover of Christmas Eve, you might recall. All that skullduggery, because it was just, it's the saddest thing that's ever happened to the country. Started with the Federal uh, Housing Administration, and then they, as as you point out, they tacked on Ginny May, and then Fannie Mae, Fannie Mae, and then Freddie Mac, and they even did Sally Mae, that was to get student loans out there. And I have read that these institutions collectively have actually underwritten 78% of the mortgages. You're right. And then, of course, they gave tax breaks, and then they created the FDIC, so they told depositors, don't worry about what your banks are doing, you know. So you've got private banks lending to real estate, and yet even then, they can only do 22% because the government is doing so much lending. It's created uh, such a horrible situation, and the argument they used was, we want everyone to enjoy the American dream by owning a house. Well, they have destroyed the American dream because instead of owning a house, Everybody owes a house. They owe the bank their house. That's the complete opposite of the American dream. Had we stayed on real money and never gone to a fiat system, there would have been very cautious lending, and most of the people in houses today would actually own the home with real money. If we 